Hugo Grotius, Contractualism and the Concept of Private Property, an Institutionalist Interpretation, by Marcelo de Araujo. In this paper, I discuss Hugo Grotius's theory of private property. Even though Grotius is one of the most important philosophers in the tradition of natural law, he does not conceive of a property right in terms of a natural right, but rather in terms of a man-made institution. The right to own an object was created by man as a, as a development of the natural right to use an object that has no owner. In his argument for a transition from use right to property right, Grotius presents the basic elements of a theory of human institutions. First, he elucidates the concept of law, even natural law, as something the existence of which depends on the existence of a will. Second, he explains the existence of normative entities, such as private property or territorial boundaries, as resulting from the collective recognition that a certain object has a normative status, not in virtue of its physical properties, but in virtue of a mental act performed as a collective, at a collective basis. 1. Grotius's main works are De Jure Praede and De Jure Belli Act Pagis. The later was published in 1625, while the former was only partially published during the Grotius' lifetime in 1609 as Mare Liberum. It was not until 1864 that the remaining part of De Jure Pride was discovered and then published four years later. The title De Jure Pride was given by its editor, not by Grotius himself. The previously published text, Mare Liberum, con constitutes the twelfth chapter of the larger work De Uri Pride. In the second chapter of De Uri Pride, the Prolegomena, Grotius presents nine rules from which he derives thirteen laws. The rules themselves do not prescribe the enactment of any actions. They are not commands, but basic propositions, the truth of which not even the skeptic, at least in principle, could put into question. The laws, laws, on the other hand, are kinds of commands. They are not, strictly speaking, supposed to be true, but to be valid. The transition from what is stated by the rule to what one ought to do for the sake of law is possible because the rules simply point out that the existence of a certain law depends on the existence of a certain will, whereas the laws express what the content of the will is. A rule, thus, enables us to do three things. 1. To recognize what counts as law. 2. To realize what the source of the law is. And 3. To identify the individuals who are, addressing, who are addressed by the law. The rules have the following basic structure. The will of X counts as law, just, for Y. The laws, then, enjoin Y to do what X wills. The will of X is a legitimate law for Y if, and only if, X has the right, just, to command Y to act upon his or her will. A right, just, is a form of power or authority to which Grotius refers as a facultas or potestas, and which entitles one to do something rightfully. Grotius is aware that the same word, just, is used in this context to convey two different ideas. Jus, comprehended as a facultas or potestas, differs from jus, comprehended as the institution of law. Both X and Y can be either a single individual or a body of individuals. Consider the first five rules in order to illustrate how Grotius speaks of rules. Rule 1. What God has shown to be his will, that is law. Rule 2. What the common consent of mankind has shown to be will of all, that is law. Rule 3. What each individual has indicated to be his will, that is law with respect to him. Rule 4. What the commonwealth has indicated to be its will, that is law in regard to the whole body of citizens. Rule 5. What the commonwealth has indicated to be its will, that is law for the individual citizens in their mutual relations. Grotius assumes that God wants human beings to preserve their own existence as much as possible. Hence, two natural laws, legis juris nat naturalis, may be derived from the first rule. The first law, lex one, is the following. It shall be permissible to defend one, 
defend one's own life and to shun that which threatens to prove in injurious. The second law, Lex 2, affirms, it shall be permissible to acquire for oneself and to retain those things which are useful for life. The first and the second laws of nature aim solely at the furtherance of one's own good, de bono suo, irrespective of what happens to other individuals. For this reason, Grotius argues that even the skeptics, the academics, would accept the validity of the first and second law of nature. Indeed, the skeptics' claim, as Grotius affirms later in De Juri Belli Ac Pagis, is that human beings are predominantly moved by self-interest. It is for the sake of self-interest, accordingly, that human laws are created. What would human interaction look like if every human being were constantly determined to do, without any restriction, what the first and second laws of nature determine? Against the skeptic, Grotius argues that, if individuals were constantly intent on implementing their own interest, human interaction would be characterized by conflict rather than by harmony. In order to comply with the first law of nature and ensure that my life is not ever endangered by other individuals, I could adopt, for example, the preemptive strategy of always threatening other individuals before being threatened by them in the first instance. In like manner, in order to act in accordance with the second law of nature, I could take from other individuals and retain for myself whatever I judge to be useful for my own life. The problem, however, is that the unrestrained compliance with the first and second laws of nature, which derive from God's will that human beings preserve their own existence as much as possible, would lead to human destruction rather than to human preservation. Thus, even though the first and second laws of nature command individuals to act upon God's will to promote human preservation, these laws alone are not sufficient to guarantee the fulfillment of God's will. As Grotius puts it, But God judged that there would be insufficient provisions for the preservation of his work. If he commended to each individual's care only the safety of that particular individual, without also willing that one created being that one created being should have regard for the welfare of his fellow beings in such a way that all might be linked in mutual harmony as if by an everlasting covenant. Thus, even though individuals are predominantly moved by self-interest or love for oneself, they are also capable of indulging themselves in love for others. Because human beings are capable of love for others, they are also able to live a peaceful life, as though it resulted from a kind of assent to an enduring pact among themselves. This capacity of love for other, amor alterius, to which Grotius also, Grotius, Grotius also refers in terms of a desire of society, appetitus societatis, is a care of society, societatis custodia, or friendliness, amicitiae precludes one individual from pursuing the maximization of his or her own interests in a way that is deleterious to the maximization of the interests of other individuals. But it is important to notice, as many authors have already pointed out, that Grotius's theory, thesis that human beings are capable of love for others, cannot be taken as an endorsement of the tra traditional Aristotelian and Thomas idea according to which human beings would be by nature a kind of political animal. Friendliness toward other individuals may be considered a natural human feature only to the extent that reason is the supreme attribute of human beings. It means that in our relationship with other individuals we are not simply moved by a natural desire to act friendly toward them. We also understand that other individuals will not treat us in a friendly fashion unless we are also friendly to them. We understand, moreover, that to react with friendliness to a threatening party may be self-damaging, and this runs counter to the first law of nature. Thus, because human beings are capable of love for others, a moral terius, they are able to live in society. On the other hand, because they are also moved by love of oneself, amor sui, it is necessary that the social life be governed by principles that preclude the unconstrained pursuit of one's own interest. 
Grotius formulates, then, two further laws of nature that relate, differently from the first and second laws of nature, to the well-being of other individuals, de bono alieno. The third law of nature affirms the following, let no one inflict injury upon his fellow. The fourth law of nature in its turn affirms, let no one seize possession of that which has been taken into possession of another. The third and fourth laws of nature restrict compliance with the first and second laws of nature to the limits of fairness. It is through observance of the second and fourth laws of nature that the concept of property, dominium, may arise. Once the concept of pro property has been introduced, a distinction between mine and thine can be made. But for Grotius, the existence of property, right, cannot be justified solely on the grounds of the second and fourth laws of nature. The existence of a property right depends also on the existence of a human institution in the context of which a diversity of objects, objects such as apples, land, cloths, chattels, etc., may acquire the status of someone's property.